about the church in the scriptures. One might ask the question, who is or what is the church? The church is the bride of Christ. The church began in Acts 2 at Pentecost and will go to the end of the age and the rapture of the church when the Lord comes back for all of us who are saved during this time period so that the bride of Christ or the universal church is made up of all believers from Pentecost to the rapture. Most of the time that the scripture uses the word church, it's talking about a local church. <clears throat> but some of the time, only a handful of the little over a hundred references to the word ecclesia in the New Testament uh, refer to the bride of Christ. But this handful of verses clearly refer to believers that are outside any given location. The word universal church, of course, isn't in the scripture. It's the term that we use to describe the whole body of Christ, all the believers saved from the time of uh, Acts 2 and Pentecost until the rapture. And this picture gives us an example for within local churches, the truly saved within those churches comprise most of the believers in the body of Christ. This word body and bride are also used uh, in other verses that refer to the church. The word ecclesia is not used, but the bride of Christ may be spoken of, or the body of Christ, and clearly it refers to this group of entirely saved people uh, during this time period. So the bride of Christ and the universal church <clears throat> make up the body of of our Lord and we call that the church in its universal aspect. Most of the verses in the New Testament refer to a church in a particular place. This would be a local church. Now as we think about it, a local church is defined as this. It is a group of believers banded together under the authority of the New Testament to do the work of Christ, to do public ministry. You have truly saved people that follow the instructions of the New Testament, of course, and that would include baptism and identifying with the Lord and His program during the church age, and that would in, uh, involve uh, the uh, ordinances of the church as we remember the death and burial and resurrection of, the G uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it would uh, involve all the missionary and the outreach uh, programs that the New Testament uh, urges believers to do. So the local church is made up of believers banded together under the authority of the New Testament. Now in the local church it is possible and, and very likely, that we have those that aren't really saved that are there because of either ignorance or because of deceit of Satan or even their own selves who think they are saved, who are just professing believers. So a local church uh, would not contain 100% of truly saved people if it was very large. We would assume that that would be the case, that there might be some that only profess Christ or do not understand completely or have uh, uh, not really trusted Christ, but have become and joined that local assembly. Uh, <clears throat> so we talk about the universal church, the bride of Christ. It's made up of the truly saved from the local church. The local church is a very important unit for the Lord because at any particular given time of history, it is the organization and the organism that does the work of the Lord on earth, that, that does public ministry. Now we do not have any scripture that tells us that this is what the local church is supposed to do. 
we only have the example of Scripture that this is what God did in beginning His church. That the believers in Jerusalem formed a church, a local assembly in Jerusalem, that did the ministry of evangelism and telling forth the gospel and receiving uh, believers into that body at Jerusalem. And then there was one at Antioch, and then there was one everywhere the gospel went and believers were formed. Paul did this on his missionary journeys. He would go and preach in a town and when people were saved, he would organize them into a group and give them teaching and the body of scripture that they had available at that time and they would form a church there in that location to do the work of Christ. We do not have specific instructions for this, but we do have this as obviously what has taken place. And so uh, many, most uh, theologians and most Bible scholars recognize that the local church has a very prominent place in doing the work of Christ in this world. Some responsibilities <coughs> in the Christian life may be private. We have a responsibility to pray, to read the Bible, to tell other people about Jesus. And of course, I believe it is God's will that when we get saved, we join local churches and that we, we conduct our ministry and our outreach into the world in an organized way, working with other believers. And this is what we have in the New Testament in, in the local church. The officers of the church. We have deacons and Acts 6 tells us about the uh, beginning of the uh, office of the deacon in the church and the reasons for it. And 1 Timothy 3 tells us about some of the qualifications of a deacon. We have the office of pastor, which is referred to that way in the scripture and it's also referred to in the terms elder and bishop. And I believe as you read these passages where the word bishop and the word elder are used, uh, I would agree with others who say that there may have been in one large local assembly, there may have been several elders that had different responsibilities on a staff and preaching and, and doing different things and exercising different gifts in the, that church. There was probably one elder that was the ruler over them all, or the head one, what we would call a senior pastor today in a church. And for that responsibility, the word bishop is used. But they're used interchangeable as we read the New Testament and we find them. And so I, it is my opinion that the term elder and the term bishop and the term pastor teacher refer all to the same office in the church. The leader who uh, had gifts and abilities in teaching and preaching the Word of God and administrating the affairs of the church in that particular location. <clears throat> the particular scriptures that we find uh, for these two, uh, for the, the gift of pastor anyway, of course we have uh, we have 1 Timothy 3, the qualifications of an individual pastor. But Ephesians 4 and 1 uh, Corinthians 12 give us a lift of spiritual gifts where Paul says that the Holy Spirit took these particular gifts and gave them to the, uh, to the church. And so we want to look at Ephesians 4 and we want to read that, that passage of Scripture, and we want to uh, get the context of it and see what he's talking about here. There's something very important that, that we will also take up under our, our teaching of dispensational truth about some of these spiritual gifts here, and so we want to look at that. Start with verse 7 of chapter 4, and we'll read through verse 12. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now he, uh, that he ascended, what is it, but he also descended first into the lower part of the earth. 
He that descended is the same that ascended up far above heavens that he might uh, fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And so we find these officers given by the Holy Spirit upon the ascension of our Lord after the resurrection for the work of the church and for the edifying of the body of Christ, which is, the, of course, the universal aspect of the church. Uh, and that universal aspect at any time would be resident in different points on the earth where local churches were at. And so these offices were given. I would ask you this, just read the gifts here, and I would ask you, which do you have in your church today? We have teachers and pastors, and we have evangelists. We do not have apostles in our church today. And we believe, and I believe, that those particular offices given to the church were given in the beginning of the church. They had only the Old Testament scriptures written down. The New Testament was in the process of being written. How would they decide questions of authority? We have the whole word of God today, so we, we simply believe what God has given us, but they did not have that. The church was not in the Old Testament. This was new ground. This was a new thing. And so God gave, I think, two temporary offices to local churches to help them to know what God wanted them to do, to verify the writings of Scripture, to say what was Scripture and what was not, to, to settle issues of dispute and doctrine among them. He gave them apostles, and of course we know that there were twelve, and Paul, because of his particular responsibilities from the Lord was added to that as he describes in the epistles how that, that he who was a, 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 a chosen vessel was added after due time. And we know we had at least the 12 apostles and the one that replaced Judas, of course, from Thias. And then we had Paul. And that may have been all that they were. Perhaps others were who had been witnesses of the resurrection, and that was one of the things that the apostle must have. And of course, Paul saw the Lord on the road to Damascus, and so he would qualify for that. But uh, I, I imagine that there were a very limited number of apostles. And then they had prophets, remember, in the church. And when Paul was being taken back, uh, uh, was fixing to go to Jerusalem, and remember that Philip's daughter, and Philip had, uh, they had some of the responsibilities in the church of that who was prophets. And they spoke of him being bound. A prophet was necessary in the local church and a little bit different from the Old Testament because these people in the local church were able to verify scripture. They were able to say, this is from God. This is God's word. And, of course, Paul talks about not being deceived from letters from others that pretended to be from him. And so evidently there was a lot of false things or a lot of things written by other people claiming to be somebody outstanding uh, in the area of teaching. And the church had to have this office to verify what was truth and what was not. But historically these two offices dropped out of the church around 300 A.D., which was the time that the canon of Scripture was completely recognized. By about that time, there was universal agreement among believers about the, the uh, number of books and what books should be considered in the canon of Scripture. And so after that time, there was no longer any need for the authority of a prophet or the office of an apostle in the church because God wants us to be led by his word today and to be led by a human being who is specially trained in his word but our authority is not just in the pastor of the church we are not of the Roman persuasion that says the Pope and the church decide what is truth 
we believe that God's word is truth and that is the authority and we want our pastors to understand and preach what the word of God says so when the canon of scripture was completed these offices stopped in the historical record of the church and that's why it's obvious to me along with some of the spiritual gifts that we will talk about in the dispensational truth study that these gifts were temporary these offices were temporary and we do not have them today except in very fringe groups who try to trace the line of authority back to the New Testament times through every single individual church leader that they have ever had in history. But it's a very limited thing and it doesn't represent the, the, the views of uh, the majority of the church. I ask you, are there apostles in your church? Who are they? And you don't have them. And if there are a permanent office, we would have them if the Holy Spirit was guiding us at all. And so we conclude and believe that there weren't permanent offices. And then we want to talk finally about the growth of the church. And here again, we do not have definite guidelines from the Word of God. We do not have definite scriptures that say how the procedure is to be done. We have the pattern of Acts and we see that and follow that. And so our pattern and our belief generally for missions and the planning of churches is this, that missionaries and leaders and workers that are qualified and trained are sent out with the gospel, the truth, the word of God into areas that do not know the scripture and do not have saved people in them or do not have organized churches there. We, we send them to mission fields. They give the gospel. Converts are, are one to Christ and those converts are organized into a New Testament church. We believe it is God's plan for that church to form another church. For that church to take the gospel that it has in the organized workers and God would call people from that church and especially this idea of an indigenous missions that eventually the missionary that came originally with the gospel is to turn the work of the gospel to people that are saved from that region and they who are part of that land and world and have received Christ are the best and proper means to lead the work of Christ in that area. And that's indigenous uh, New Testament church planning and mission. And we believe generally that that is God's will. That we send a missionary. Converts are organized into a local church. That church reaches out and sends somebody else into an area where it cannot minister locally. That church is founded and sends out a missionary into another area where we cannot reach, that is, uh, and where the influence is, and another church here and there. And so we believe that is the way that the church should be planted. And evangelism and mission should be conducted. My question simply is this. If we believe that, and, and most fundamental Christians would, they would recognize that that was the pattern in the ministry of Paul, that God led him to different spots and towns. Not everywhere Paul stopped was there necessarily a church uh, banded together, but where uh, uh, believers were one, there seemed to be, uh, where converts were one, and if he stopped and stayed there under the help of the Holy Spirit, converts were one, a church was established wherever he went. And the church at Jerusalem, of course, sent workers out when they were persecuted to other areas. If we believe that, why do not we do that in America? Does God have two plans? One for the rest of the world and one for America? And I know that some churches do plant other churches where they cannot minister and go and cannot reach to. But it is not a recognized thing that that is the plan and obligation from the Lord to do that. We recognize that on mission fields, but we don't practice it here in America as much as we should. 
And so I believe that as we view this thing of what the church is to do and, and how it is to grow, that we must take into consideration that perhaps God's plan for us is the same as His plan for taking the gospel to regions where there are uh, no churches and where maybe we have to speak a different language. And so I would feel that when a church is productive and blessed of God in this area and, and is reaching the people in this area, that it, the thought must be, how can we take the gospel where we cannot reach and plan another church? And so I would put this before you that this may be the, God, the will of the Lord in, in this thing of our growth and our establishing of churches even so more than we've ever done it before in America. And there are a lot of people that would agree with me and some that may not. But here we have the basic themes about the church. <coughs> what is the church? Who is it? The church is the bride of Jesus Christ. It is His spiritual <coughs> body. It is made up of every person truly saved from Pentecost until the rapture. That is His church. And that this church of believers in the world is resident in local assemblies that are banded together under the authority of the New Testament <coughs> to do the work of Christ. And that the offices of the church are deacon and pastor and teacher. Pastor, teacher perhaps being the law. And that the growth of the church is through Planting churches where we cannot go and that church reaching out and planting another church and planting another church and another church where we cannot go. And that local churches are organized and ordained of God to do the work of Christ in this world, that is to do public ministry. search the scripture and compare the things that we have taught and seen and talked about today and along with the history that God gave in Revelation 2 and 3 this will help you to understand God's plan and program and will for the church Amen